while we feel like we are really firmly rooted in an amazing legacy, we also know what it means to miss people who are central to your life. So we know that loving each other across difference is way more important than any of the bullshit people put on how people love. Welcome to Normalizing Non-Monogamy, the podcast where we interview incredible people from across the entire spectrum of non-monogamy to hear their fascinating stories. We strive to bring guests on the show who have a healthy approach to non-monogamy. However, it's important to remember that everyone does it a little bit differently, and the views and opinions expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect our own. Additionally, we produce this show for entertainment purposes only. Please be aware that we aren't doctors or therapists. Consult a medical professional for anything regarding your health that you might learn about on the show. Enjoy! Welcome to episode 185. We're Finn and Emma, and today we have an amazing interview with Kelly. She has been practicing polyamory for a really long time, over 30 years, which is amazing. And we have a wonderful discussion with her. Yeah, as she says, she's been doing it since before polyamory was even a word. Yes. So yeah, it's it's an incredible interview about just uh, all things, about being just a kind human, about boundaries, about creating the relationships that work for you. And just, it's amazing. So thank you, Kelly, for reaching out, for being here, and for sharing your story and just being an awesome human. Yes, thank you so much. Before we jump into her interview, we do have a couple of quick announcements. The first is our next virtual meet and greet is June 23rd. That is a Wednesday night. We took it off of the weekend because everyone's doing summer activities. So we wanted to to do it on a Wednesday. It's from 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Come join us. It's only $10, open to anyone, and they're super fun. So, yeah, come join us. Yeah, we would absolutely love to have you join us. And a huge thank you to everybody who has joined us in the past and making these a huge, fun success. Yes, we've been doing them over a year now, and they're super fun. Crazy. Crazy, I know. All right, one more quick shout out before we jump into the interview. Actually, two more. Two more, but if I say (laughs) one, you'll stick around. So one more quick shout out. Uh, Huge thank you to all of the Patreon supporters. We've got over 165 people in the community now. It's fantastic. If you're looking for a supportive, inclusive, amazing community of open-minded people, head over to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com. Click on the Patreon tab. You can read all about it. We're not going to say anything more about it right now because we just did all of our calls for the month of May and and June. Well, I don't know, whatever month it is. (laughs) We'll have stuff coming up in July. The dates will be updated shortly, but in the meantime, there is ongoing support and chats and everything happening. So check that out. We'd love to have you join us. If if you decide it's not for you, no worries. You can always cancel. We don't take it personally. I take it personally. Emma doesn't take it personally. No, I do not. (laughs) So the last final thing for real this time. Yes. So if you are getting back out in the world, we highly encourage you to get tested for STIs. And our favorite way to do that is to use stecheck.com. If you listen to the show, you've heard us talk about it before. However, we're not going to talk about it here. What we're going to do is we're going to say, if you're a listener and you've used the service before and you loved it, hopefully you loved it, even if you didn't, send us a voicemail. Let us know what you thought. And if we use the voicemail or if you let us use the voicemail right here in the intro, we will give you a free entry to at least one of the upcoming virtual meet and greets. Yes. Maybe two, maybe three. I don't know. Depends yes. on how awesome you are <laughs> and how generous we're feeling on that day. Right. We'd love to have hear your stories about using SED Check. And also, just if you want to use SED Check, go to our website. Use the links there. It does support the show. So we appreciate you. And you get a discount for doing that. Yes. To learn more about that, head over to our website, again, normalizingnonmonogamy.com. You can click on the resources tab or in your podcast player, there's direct links that will take you there, save you the $10, and you can learn everything about it. And while you're on our website, don't forget to reach out to us. Come say hi. We'd love to have a voicemail or email from you uh, Yeah, anytime. There's also a, a podcast tab on our website that has show notes for every episode that we've ever released. So go check all of that out. And I think with that, let's go talk to Kelly. Welcome, Kelly, to the show. We're so excited to have you here. And thank you so much for reaching out and wanting to share your story. And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Norm put you in touch with us. Is that correct? Oh, um, I think it's that I I knew he had been interviewed. I know he and um, 
and Rachel have both been interviewed and I know them. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you, Norm. Yeah. He just, yes. I, I think he just gave you a vote of um, okay. like, yeah, they're good. You should do it. <laughs> hey, we'll, we'll take it. That sounds like, that sounds like Norm. We'll yeah. take it from yeah. him. So yeah. appreciate it. Yeah. It was good. <laughs> and it was just for me, I hadn't seen him in a while and it was just a uh, context in which it was nice to see him. Yeah. Awesome. Well, months. Perfect. And thank you, as Emma said, for being here. Um, we're excited to learn more about you. And maybe we'll just let you introduce yourself, who who is Kelly, and then we'll dive into your story. Sure. I am a 55-year-old Black woman. I am a person from the U.S., but I work outside the U.S. for a big part of my um, time. So this whole COVID thing has been very weird. Um, cause I feel very trapped inside the U S and I am someone who studies lots across lots of different disciplines, but part of the work that I do is informed by being outside the U S because it gives me sort of the, a break from all of the different ways that you can, as a, a woman and a black person in the U S context sort of feel trapped and feel like you're in a situation where it's difficult to fully breathe and fully, um, in my case, think clearly. <laughs> so just using the ways that there's a scholar, Eddie Glaude, who talks about just having the little bit of space that you get, even when you're in another country that has similar oppressions. But when you're not the local target, there's a way in which even that small difference gives you that and having the protection of a U.S. passport sort of gives you that little extra room to breathe. So mm-hmm. that's a big part of why I work largely outside the U.S. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. And and thank you, you know, for coming on the show to share about that and about, yeah, I know you've expressed us, you've done a lot of work. And, um, yeah, I guess we're just we're really grateful for that and we're excited to hear more about it and we're excited to hear more about your story and what, you know, what it brought you to a show about non-monogamy. So maybe (laughs) if you want to take us back to the beginning, I mean, or maybe start with a high level overview, maybe it would be a good place. Yeah. Like what does, as far as non-monogamy or relationships go, what does that look like for you right now? And then, and then maybe we'll figure out how we got here. (laughs) All right. Um, So I have pretty much been non-monogamous since the beginning of my dating life. And because I'm a, at this point, a cranky middle-aged lady, that means more than 30 years. And I currently have one local partner and I have one partner um, in Europe that I met when I lived over there a few years ago. So those are, and a few people that I talked to, but I was thinking about it a few days ago, and most of my relationships have been non-local because I do live and travel so much in other places. So, yep, that's where I am right now. Um, And as I said, it's pretty much always because because of how long, I guess, I've been. I don't know if I would say I've been practicing in some formal way, but I've been poly since before there was that word for it. Um, My sort of my first college boyfriend And I met the person I ended up dating at the same time as him at a party when I was a freshman in college in the mid 80s. So that dates me a bit. (laughs) Yeah, no, hey, don't judge me here. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I I was curious too before, like, before we jump back in time to like maybe how. I think it's it's fascinating that, like, you know, back in the in that time, like, I don't think, like you said, it didn't even have a word for what Mm -hmm. you did. And so you were sort of blazing uh your own trail but i was just curious now that like with your world being very i mean obviously the last year hasn't has been an exception but like transient you're moving you're traveling do you feel that like having the different relationships and having that freedom really fits with that lifestyle um i guess in some way um it really isn't I've never thought about it exactly in that way. I always sort of knew something was different about the way I looked at relationships, even from when I was high school or younger. Um, And I knew that the way that I looked at them was different than what people around me did. Um, I never sort of understood the kind of possessiveness I saw in other people. 
whether that was in relationships or otherwise and friendships or even in family relationships. I tease my baby sister who's she's 45. I shouldn't call her baby, but she's will always be my baby sister, but there's a way in which just by personality she is much more sort of wedded to roles in certain ways, like even of our parents. She has sort of really concrete ideas of what the role our parents should have. And in my view, they're still just people. And so there's just a lot of those kind of differences I noticed. But for me, it wasn't a huge thing because I was already so different. I'm a kid who fell in love with math that in the second grade, I knew that was different. You know, I'm a little brown girl who does science. I knew that was different. Um, And these other things were so prominent to me and to who I am that this just being one other way that I was different wasn't huge to me. And I consider that a blessing. I really do think it's because I was raised in an amazing, large, very loving family. And I'm sort of grounded in the confidence that comes from both my family history and the way that I was loved. So I never, I've heard other people described having similar orientations, but really having a lot of self-judgment, and I didn't have that. Um, Mm -hmm. My parents have always been very accepting and supportive, and even when they didn't understand, like I remember my dad saying to me quite early on, um, because I did math camp with my friends and sports camp with my sisters, and very early on him saying, I don't know what the hell you're talking about, but I know there are people in the world who do that. So, so yeah, it's, it's just part of who I am. So mm-hmm. I didn't, I didn't feel like I was doing something particularly creative. I just happened, those, the people who felt and thought similarly are the people I attracted and I just right. didn't have. Yeah. And I, and I guess I should say the other issue really for me, really fundamental issue for me. Um, and I didn't have this language until my thirties. I met a, a friend who uh, who really articulated this, but through high school, certainly in undergrad, absolutely in graduate school, my relationships were all about, or my orientation toward them was always like, I'm, I'm all about A's and orgasms. You can contribute to either one of those or both, but I wasn't, I also wasn't in the world looking for sort of permanent, super long-term relationships either. So mm-hmm. I'm sure that had an influence. My yeah, and, it sounds, and you said that central. that was from the beginning, right? From high school yeah. on up, like from basically all relationships. And I think, oh, yeah. I think that's really, I mean, self aware for, for right. one, which well, is awesome. And the yeah. question I had was, you said like you grew up in a very loving and big family, but were different relationship structures modeled for you at all during that growing up? Um, not. Not different relationship structures, okay? The most the most direct way for me to answer that is that my mother and her siblings lost their parents at an extremely early age, but they were embedded in a community that cared for them in ways that we probably couldn't imagine today. They're from a small town. And we just had a super clear idea of what was important. And judging people about the way they love or who they love was not on that list. Like I would have given the sacrifices and the things that my mother's parents and grandmother, my mother's parents and grandparents made for us. And we can talk about some of this perhaps another time, but um, yeah, those were the things I wish I would have gotten a chance to know them but they were both gone by the time my mother was eight. So while we feel like we are really firmly rooted in an amazing legacy, we also know what it means to miss people who are central to your life. So we know that loving each other across difference is way more important than any of the bullshit people put on how people love. Yeah. I think that's incredible that their, their presence in your life is, very concrete and real yet you've never met them um so i think that's that's amazing powerful um i think what i would maybe love to hear a little more about is like when you said you said growing up going through school it was about a's and orgasms and like what did that like maybe what did that look like back then and how has that 
evolved for you over time to where you are today? Well, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> I mean, I still like orgasms. I've been well, yeah, no, of... I'm not. I'm not saying you've given up the A's and the orgasms. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been out of graduate school for a couple decades, more than that now. Um, so I'm not so much worried about A's, but um, for me, like I do have really thriving long-term relationships. Both my partners I've been with for a long time, one for seven years, the other one for four and a half, something like that. I had, I knew my ex-husband for 25 years. Um, We weren't together that whole time. But I guess what that means to me is that I knew, especially when I was in school, I knew what I was focusing on, that was the hard stuff. And that was really such a central focus of what I was, what I spent my time and energy worrying about. But I always have felt like I had plenty of people around me who cared about me and took care of me in various ways. Uh, yeah, my longest term partner currently, both of us are science type people. Other than, you know, I think it's a little bizarre how he rotates T-shirts to make sure they wear evenly. I don't, I know too many scientists or engineers that do that, but I think it's a weird boy thing. (laughs) But he has, you know, he's one of the people in my life that really, I think we've come to the best balance of how we take care of each other in unconventional ways. And I think that really characterizes most of my relationships I'm not I'm extremely independent, thanks to my mother. And I am, um, yeah, I'm just a person who lives really the life of the mind. So I don't, I don't think I seek from relationships some of the more traditional things. I'm not looking for someone to, I don't know, buy me a house, pay bills, do things like that. I'm looking for, I'm looking to co-create with most people I, I end up partnering with. And other than that, I have lovely connections that I really like. People perhaps that I see once or twice a year because we happen to be on the planet in the same place. But yeah. 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 yeah I was curious if you could maybe to whatever level you're comfortable, like uh, elaborate on like some of the You said there was maybe you look for some more unconventional things out of your partnerships. And I think that's really important because one of the things that we we hear from a lot of people is that like a big part of polyamory for them is like recognizing that no single person can meet all of their needs or provide all of their needs. And so it sounds like you probably from what you've said, like you get a little you get some things from this person, some things from that person, but they're, they're not necessarily the things that everybody might think we would be looking for in a partner. And I guess if you'd be willing to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's been different things at different times in our lives, right? In our twenties, we all think we're sex gods and we're not. Um, And so note to those people who still are thinking that, but I think Truly for me, especially at this time in my life, I knew after my divorce that I was specifically looking for kindness and I was looking for certain levels of like just basic competency and maturity. Like I'm just past the, um, the point where one of my teachers says, I don't, I don't connect with people based on the, potential of what they can be. I try to be very clear eyed about who people are and where people are. And so I'm happy to share. I'm happy to encourage, but I don't really seek partners who are still trying to become something. And it's not a judgment thing. It's just, that's not the emotional labor I want to do at this point in my life. Again, maybe just cranky old lady, but that's not where I am. Um, I also don't educate. So I don't date people who are new to poly I generally don't just in, in lots of spaces. And I'm sure you guys have heard plenty of this before. I, I get a lot of sort of fetishizing, um, especially from young people. There are people who just have all these myths about older black women and no, I'm not a dom, nothing on my 
any of my profiles says that. So I'm not interested in that. But I just, I mean, I would say right now, the people that I meet, the people who I'm partnered with right now, what they have most in common is they're just deeply kind people. Both of my current partners have a weird fascination with dad jokes. Um, in fact, they have, at one point, they uh, shared the same dad joke app. <laughs> and so I was getting wooed by often the same dad joke in, in the same day. Um, so they're some of the silliest humans you'll ever meet. But they also are truly deeply kind people. They take mm-hmm. care of each other. They work together to take care of me. And we just laugh a lot. Yeah. And those are the things I'm looking for. And then um, on some level, all of us co-create together. So, yeah, yeah, those are the that. main Thank things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. Uh, I wanted to jump back, I guess, uh, in time and think about when you were first exploring different relate, like multiple partners and, and early on in your journey, did you have any... I'm assuming probably yes, but I'm not going to put words in your mouth. <laughs> Did you have any uh, like challenges or grow, growing opportunities in, in that time that you can remember and would want to share? Um, I think I, I mean, it just depends. Again, I remember specifically when I was in graduate school, in hindsight, I wasn't always kind to all the boys. Um, I was really, especially at, different points. Like there was probably a good year when I was studying for my comps that I was pretty cranky with everybody. And then there were times when I was trying to finish my dissertation that I was pretty cranky. So I just didn't, I didn't have a lot of space. I think I could have been a lot kinder to people. Um, but I tended to be fairly short and there are people who even an undergraduate who I knew cared about me, but sometimes they also had ideas that conflicted with mine and I didn't create a lot of space for us to figure out what we might have in common. Like I just didn't give people a lot of time for that kind of thing. I specifically remember again, going back to some of the ways I knew I was different. Several people that I met, especially early on in my undergrad time, had all kinds of judgments. Like I, I remember I went to high school prom with what was at the time my best friend. And there are people sort of in our social circle who I went to undergrad with who had all kinds of judgments about who he took the prom and how I was supposed to feel about that and all kinds of things like that. And there was one person in particular who I really liked, I liked spending time with, but who sort of piled on to sort of those group judgments for lack of another description. And I was just like, yeah, dude, you seem like a nice guy, but you're not for me. You're judgmental in a way that I, and I don't, didn't feel like unpacking that with him. I was just like, I got three other guys who aren't giving me a hard time about some bullshit like this. So I'm out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you, I mean, it sounds like you had, like multiple concurrent like partners at that point, even. Yeah. Um, I think just kind of understanding, I mean, I know we, we, we've talked to younger people today, people who are coming, you know, just graduated high school or maybe just graduated college. And that's a little more common now. Like there's a little more fluidity. Things are a little more open like that, but back in the early eighties, like I guess I wasn't there, but was that common or were you sort of bla- again, were you sort of like doing something that nobody else was doing and like how um, I guess I'm just like blown <laughs> away by that. Like that ability to just be like, I don't care what you think I'm going to do what works for me and you can get on board or you can get out of the way kind of. Yeah. I think it was mostly because like, I, I liked the people that I spent time with, that I partied with. Certainly, I was very Greek in undergrad. Like, I I had a good time. But to be honest, if you weren't really into quantum device theory, I probably wasn't all that excited about you beyond a certain point. Um, I I didn't feel like I was blazing anything anything um in that way 
because I think when you, at least for us during undergrad, we had a lot of different social connections. Like I did a lot of things. I recruited for Big Ten athletics. I was, as I said, very Greek. I did a bunch of stuff. So I felt like I had all these different spheres that I operated in. And and it just, yeah, dating just wasn't the thing that I worried about. Like it just, in that sort of 20s way, it felt like it was abundant, right? Especially if you're a young woman in science, you know, the ratios are all in your favor. So it's not, it's not like it was hard. Um, yeah, I but, would... Uh... I can relate to that one. We both went to an engineering school and uh, <laughs> one of us had a much easier time in the dating world than the other. And that wasn't in the eighties. <laughs> yeah. And the other, and the other issue really that was central for us is that was right at the beginning of HIV and AIDS. So, you know, my mom sent me, she originally gave all of us when we went to college a basket of condoms. And so she was always asking, is your basket full? Like we were so focused on how do we stay safe. I remember some of the priests I knew that I shot darts with um, did this whole thing across campus where they were saying, look, this stuff is real despite what politicians are saying. And even if you just think one person in each housing unit is infected, how quickly that would spread. And you guys just need to protect yourselves. Like that's what we were worried about. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. Super hard. Um, and, and at, at what point do you kind of transition from it's more maybe like casual, like you're focused on your school, you're focused on the degrees and the academics to like shifting to like this thing, polyamory, whether it had a word or not, but like mm. some longer term, more focused on the relationship. Yeah. Focusing on like, developing those relationships versus almost I don't want to say relationships of service, but like they were sort of sort of focused on like getting a need met while you were trying to do a whole bunch of other really hard stuff. Yeah. I mean, I, um, so I mentioned that my ex-husband and I knew each other a really long time. We dated the first time when I was first in grad school and um, and we both dated other people. Um, we had a couple explicit conversations about how that looked, but we didn't have it still, it wasn't, <clears throat> it wasn't anything super structured, to be honest. The first time I heard formal words were probably after I was even out of graduate school. Um, and even then, it was, again, among, I don't know, what is it about the scientists? It was among a tribe of scientists that I was associated with, and it was more, it was more, I think it was slightly more among the women that we talked openly about what our dating lives look like. And I remember one particular friend that I'm still close to, and she and I shared a partner at that point. But again, we didn't have, like, it wasn't, probably until my 40s, to be honest, that I ran into people who were super structured about the way they approach things, had, and they were all people that I knew outside of professional settings. I would say most of the people that I dated before then were all people that had some connection to my either school or professional settings. Um, mm -hmm. And so the people I was dating then were more people I met more generally. And yeah, I just remember the first time someone showed me a list of their relationship rules. I was like, you know, this is nuts, right? This is not how adults treat each other. Um, so yeah, that stuff was all always that came very late in my life and always felt super weird. So to this day, do you still like have an aversion to the relationship rule um, model? Mm -hmm. Um, I do because I find the information that you get out of that quite limiting. Like, I think you have to talk to people to know what's real for them. I have seen and experienced people who 
would probably describe themselves as pretty rigid, be quite kind and flexible to their partners. And the opposite, I've experienced people who describe themselves as completely unstructured, but who engage in, uh, what is the word someone said, kind of a sneaky archy. Um, <laughs> and it was just always feels quite dishonest to me. Um, so I think ultimately you always have to talk to people and those kind of structures always to me, a lot of the tactics used, especially to enforce the rules always feel very much like the tactics used to enforce racial hierarchy. So that's not, that's not my jam. Um, mm-hmm. It's an area that I understand really deeply from scholarship, but it always, a lot of the ways people talk and behave often unexamined um, just remind me of that. Like you can't, you can't talk. I've heard people talk about joint exercises sort of, and it seems really benign. Oh, we're just looking through each other's dating profiles and who writes each other and whatever. But those are people you're talking about, not objects of entertainment. Um, And it just, to me, is too mindful of the, the ways in which, especially in the U.S. context, which is my primary learning experience, obviously, I'm American, but um, just the ways that Black bodies are often fetishized and people think they should have access without accountability. Um, so there's just a lot of things about that that don't vibe for me. And then for um, also for me, as someone who you know, those kind of structures have never protected me. Um, and so if I indulge in that, it's just not, it's unsafe for me to do that. It just promotes a delusion that's not safe for me. Um, I have to be able to deal with the world as it is. I also am someone who deals with chronic pain that's unpredictable. So I have to, there are times when I just have to be able to live through it. And so for me, a lot of those things are deflections from just dealing with the reality, the real pain, emotional or otherwise. And, um, and that's, that's for me, not a way to live. And so what ways do you approach that? Like you don't do the, the relationship rule book, but like, how do you protect yourself and set a structure that keeps you safe, keeps you feeling comfortable and then communicate that to the people that are going to be in your life? Um, I think we just have great communication. Like we talk through what our bound, our personal boundaries and expectations are. We come to agreements about certain things. I have agreements with my partners that we co-construct in each sort of dyad of partnership I have. Um, around our um, our health, um, things like that. We have agreements around how often we get tested, but we also have really regular ways of communicating, checking in on each other, understanding what's happening with each other in terms of health. Um, we take responsibility, really, for making our own decisions, and we have to be able to trust our partners to do to care for us in that way. And if there's a problem that arises, we deal with it. But I think, again, I, my relationships are so low drama. Like there's, I, I get, and I know people who have a lot more drama in their lives. That's never been me. And so it's, and I run from it pretty quickly, not just in my love relationships, but I remember maybe about five years ago, um, yeah, it's just before I moved to Europe, I ended a 20 year friendship based on just, and it, it was just someone who was at a bad place in their, in their own life and was starting to use some of the, the bad behavior that had been projected on them from their partner with me. And it just, I'm like, I love you, but unless we can set some boundaries where this doesn't happen again, I can't. I'm going to have to love you from somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Which is yeah. super hard to do. I was just going to say that's super It was tough. heartbreaking. I still miss that person a lot, but mm-hmm. I can't. Yeah. Yeah. 
you have to take care of yourself and do set, set some boundaries sometimes. And that's, it's a really Im- sometimes impossible thing to recognize and then actually follow through with too. Yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned that you were married and I was curious, um, you've been, you were together a new a person a long time throughout that relationship were you too open and dating other people throughout? Um, for most of it. So we were together when I was first in graduate school for a number of years, and he actually moved out of the country for work. Um, and so we we maintained like a loose friendship, but we weren't really together for a number of years until um, until maybe the last, I'd say, seven or so years we were together. That's the period in which it was mostly our marriage and some dating before then. Um, we were, there were a couple of times when we didn't, or at least I didn't. I, I think he mostly didn't maybe that he had one sort of very casual partner, but I didn't have other partners because, um, we had many years of unsuccessful IVF and I was exhausted although the hormones I have to say made me extremely happy and very horny. Um, But also during that time, my mother had a pretty major um, long-term stay at the Mayo Clinic. So I spent a lot of time with her. So I wasn't, wasn't particularly focused on dating um, Mm -hmm. around that. So, um, so with, I would say with the exception of things like that. Yeah. Like it sounds like it was always part of the conversation. Yeah. But it was, it was the way that my life was when I met him. So. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think being back or being out in the world and dating, you, you touched on, you don't edge a date. And I like that. I like that uh, (laughs) word. I hadn't, I hadn't heard it put that way. So I guess maybe like two questions on that. One would be, do you, or have you dated somebody who you're not having to necessarily educate on non-monogamy or polyamory because they don't, they're not maybe interested in polyamory other than obviously by dating you, they're involved in it in some way. Right. Um, but there's that piece of it. And then like, how do you, I guess I hear somebody who's brand new to this being like, well, how the hell am I supposed to get experience doing this? If nobody will date me, right. This is like when you go to apply for a job and they're like, we want you to have 10 years of experience for an entry level mm-hmm. job. And you're like, well, how the hell am I supposed to get 10 years of experience when I just got out of college? Right. So I think right. like for somebody who's like a little frustrated, like, well, I want to get into this. I want to get experience, but I feel judged by people. How, I don't know, kind of two yeah. questions in there and maybe I'll let you deal with that. Yeah. I'm sorry. I mean, to put that no, on you. no worries at all. <laughs> um, I, I have dated people fairly new to poly. Um, my, um, partner in Europe, he, most of the time we've dated, he hasn't had like a, a long-term partner. He has gone out on dates. He hangs out with people. Um, but he hasn't had a specific partner, but, um, and I, I would say that he probably wouldn't identify as poly. He likes to be sort of nebulous and not completely clear mostly because it drives other people crazy um but he's i mean it's he's like that anyway he has a very flexible relationship with time and he has a very flexible relationship with lots of things partly because he's extremely present and so he can be extremely present with the bus driver or someone he meets in the shops but um that's just who he is but i've yeah, across my life, I've dated quite a few people who, for the, whom this was new. And part of it is just at this point in my life, most people that I've met that are compatible with me have had significant experience, but it's not, you know, I'm at the, what do I want my legacy to be, especially with regard to my work? And I'm really not at the place where I feel like I need to be the orientation or somebody's training wheels. Yeah. Um, and most of the people who are in that position are nowhere near my age anyway. Um, you know, I don't have children of my own, but I've helped raise someone who is now approaching 32. There's 
not a lot of people that I want to date that are anywhere near his age. That just is like gross. Cause all I see is, I mean, I know he has big muscles and stuff, but all I see is baby. Yeah, yeah I can get that. <laughs> Luckily I'm 33. So I'm not offended by that. Uh- <laughs> it's all right. My, my very beautiful mother calls everybody young man. And that means, you know, if you're anywhere under 65, 70, you're in the young man category. <laughs> Perfect. Young Perfect. man, young lady, young human. Yeah. And I, I think that. too, like, I think it's completely reasonable. I wasn't like throwing judgment at you for not wanting to mm-hmm. be the, the orientation for somebody to polyamory. Cause I think, I think there are tons of different ways to get that experience and you're just one person, right? Like yeah. for every one of you, there's probably 20 people who are like, yeah, you know, I'll give it a go and see what happens. And yeah. there's, there's a million ways to get experience that are, um, you know, not Kelly. So <laughs> I was just curious what your yeah. opinion was on that when, cause I, I just, I hear people being like, Oh, people don't want to deal with new poly people. Well, how am I going to get this experience? So I was just, yeah. I was just curious. Yeah. And I, I know a lot of people like that who are quite excited to meet people who are new, quite excited to say, well, I'm going to show them my way as the right way. And I'm like, I don't have any need to do that either. Right. No, yeah. I have right. I have research students. Those are the people whose educations I'm worried about. Right. Yeah, and with relationships, it's so hard to say my way is the right way. Yeah. Like there right. is no there is no right way. No. There's the way that works for you and there's the way that works. And it's for, always for a us. journey. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I, and it's work you, anyway. You know, no exactly. matter who you're yeah. in relationship with it's work. Yeah, the work never ends. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's for yeah. sure. Uh, are you open with your family and friends about your relationship structures? And if you are, how has that gone? Because it's been who y- you are your whole life pretty much. Yeah. So I'm curious about. Yeah, how that's I mean, gone. I'm open with the people who've earned the right to be for me to be open with, you know, my family, mm-hmm. certainly. Um, my mother knows both my partners very well. Um, my dad has a little bit of dementia and to be honest, you know, unless I was going back to the kid that he knew at 18, he really doesn't want to know who I sleep with. And, uh, yeah, I mean, one of my sisters said to me last week and she's probably the sister I'm closest to. She was my maid of honor many years ago. Um, she's like, you know, I've always given this thing you do kind of the side eye, but now I get it because she called me. And she's like, what are you, this is a person who she doesn't introduce. She doesn't say hi. She's just like, what are you doing? What are you doing, sister? And I'm like, oh, B, my partner, B is flirting with me. She's like, okay, now the last 10 times I've called you, that's what you say to me, that he's flirting with you. He's, she's like, now I get it. He, you guys just really make each other happy. And, and she's like, I can recognize that the way you live really makes you happy. Oh, yeah. which is the whole point, right? Yeah. 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 That's very sweet. Yeah. I thought it was. Yeah. I, this is kind of a, a bigger, maybe a, well, I'm not even, I'm not going to copy out anything with how have you seen with relationships specifically yourself grow and change over time i know that we've we've touched on pieces of that as we've gone Mm -hmm. but has there been anything that has stuck out to you in the way you do things now that was different from before um i've gotten a lot better at partner selection um a lot um i how have i changed i i think it's as much from other things I've learned, like I have a dear friend who's an advanced teacher in the Enneagram personality model, and I learned that from her. I don't know how long have we been talking about this, quite a number of years. Um, but to me, a lot of the things I've learned through that model helps me let go of judgments of people. It makes it really easy for me to see that people have motivations that really have nothing to do with me. It sort of reinforces me letting go of my own self-judgment because I know that a good 90% 
perhaps 100%, I'm not quite there yet, of what people say about me really has nothing to do with me. It's really projections of things going on with them. Um, I think what living this way gives me is it just gives me the freedom to be the best version of myself. Um, not only because I've let go of judgment, but because I'm really focused on how do we, how do we create um, spaces in which people can just fully be themselves. People can feel loved. That's what I want for the people around me. I, I know I'm more expressive of that with everyone from my, surly teenage nieces and my nephew who don't want to hear it most of the time and really only text me and email me when they, I need to write a check for something. But just with everybody in my life, figuring out, you know, my dad lives in a nursing home. He's mostly grumpy about that. And with COVID, his buddies from the VA can't visit him and sneak him beer. So, you know, whatever, I send him other snacks I try to do whatever I can to make him feel comfortable. And I listen to him complain that he can't get a real beer. And someone, one of my sisters tried to give him a non-alcoholic beer and he wasn't having it. So, I mean, that's, I do come from a very large family. I have, there are seven of us in my immediate family, but I have like 35 first cousins. Like there's just a lot of people. And what I, what I really focus on is how do I love and care for the people I love better? Um, I am, thanks to Mayo, my mother's still here. I could have lost her a long time ago. I'm grateful every day of the week to get to hear her laugh. And, you know, at this point, the, those are the things I focus on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it sounds like it's a lot of gratitude and empathy towards other people, right? That, like you said, you know, maybe your dad is not treating you the best on one given, on any given day, but is it really you or is it because he hasn't gotten that damn beer that he wants, right? It's not, it's not you. <laughs> yeah. And and I think that is, it's really easy when partners or maybe somebody you met on a dating app um, is being shitty or they were really wonderful one day. And then the next day there's some, something's completely different or they're completely off. And you're like, what did I do? And it's, it's really easy to say, what did I do? Um, but to recognize that like, it probably isn't you in any way, shape or form is really hard. At least it's really hard for me. Yeah. I will say that. Yeah. I, I will invite you to, um, just keep growing through that. Um, I remember being young and my mother saying, once you pass 40, you'll come into this sense of your own personal power. And a lot of the things that worry you now, you won't care about. And I would underscore that twice once you pass 50. And um, although my best friend at the time, still my best friend was like, well, if you become more powerful, I'm leaving the planet. But um <laughs> But it just really, yeah, I don't worry about that at all um, because there's so many people who are going to not like you or going to be upset with you for such random things mm-hmm. that just have nothing to do with them, nothing to do with you, but nothing to do with anything. And yeah, as for my dad, most of the time his grumpiness actually makes me laugh. He is someone who spent his entire life helping people who had nobody else in the world to have, to depend on. He has earned every ounce of grumpiness he wants to be. Um, (laughs) And I would say that for my mother, by many orders of magnitude, um, I had a friend um, during my postdoc years who made a very sort of judgmental comment about something my mother was wearing. This is someone who was like Uber, whatever, and just like she's wearing animal products. And I was like, look, the, the things she has sacrificed, including her parents, to make the world a better place. And her activism started when she was six. Um, she was part of something that led to a major su- Supreme Court case. And I'm like, at this point in her life, my mother could not only club baby seals, she could club baby babies. And she has paid all of that forward. So, yeah, your comments are not welcome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 
for sure. And to be clear, she doesn't do either of those. She things. doesn't do either. <laughs> <laughs> She mostly that, she mostly laughs a lot at Mel Brooks movies still, and which is the best sound in the world, and yells at MSNBC. So <laughs> there you go. That's, that's yeah. And if she wants to wear a leather jacket while she's doing it, then she can do that. She too, can right? do that absolutely. Um, <laughs> and I, I love what you said. The the I'm loving people the best way I know how. Just putting that out there and. Just, yeah, thank you for, I'm circling back a minute, but thank you for saying that because I think that that's truly what I think so many of us are trying to do. Yeah. And it's easy to let, to let, like Finn was saying, let other people's moods like rub off on you too. But if you're trying to continually check yourself and do the best you can and love the people that mean the most, yeah. that's what we're all trying to do. And do, you, for. do you think that your ability at this point you know when you hit the 40 mark and then the 50 mark your ability to stop internalizing as much what other people are thinking and to not take that upon yourself do you think that played a role in your ability to pick better partners um i don't know to be honest i mean i i think it certainly colors the interactions i have with people across my life I, I just have a bunch of tools. Like some of them are really silly. Like often when I have to have a difficult conversation and I know I'm going to receive input, like if I'm having a conflict with someone and we have to have a hard conversation and work it out, I will tell myself, and this is true even in a professional setting, setting I will literally, if I'm alone when I'm doing this, I will say out loud, shields up, meaning put up my internal boundary. And I imagine that Star Trek, you know, that outlining an image of my body. And it's just like, okay, here we go. Um, but I also create space for myself to recover afterwards. You know, I, I try and treat myself the way that I treat other people. Yeah, if I'm disappointed about something or stressed about something, I, find, I try to find a way to laugh. I am... Um, Completely addicted to Gogglebox. If you don't know UK TV, you should look into it. It's ridiculous. <laughs> it's like regular people in the UK watching TV and responding to it. It's, yeah, as I said. <laughs> um, but there's like clips of it on Facebook or on YouTube and stuff you can watch. Mm -hmm. But that's like one of my go-tos if I need just like a three-minute or a five-minute change in attitude so that mm -hmm. I don't inflict something that happened to me on the next person I encounter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And All then right, I have great that. friends who send me dad jokes or whatever. My local partner gives the best hugs on earth. Oh, yeah. yeah and I think that's kind of that um, piece kind of going full circle of like different, different people in our lives, whether they're partners or not, uh, fulfill different needs that we have. Yeah. And I think that's just a, a great example of that. Yeah. I wanted to ask you too, I know it sounds like you have a very busy professional life and you have multiple partners of huge family. Uh, how do you balance it all? And I know that's something that a lot of people ask us in that have multiple relationships. Like they say, there's no way, like, there's no way I could do that. I just don't have the time yet. We know it's possible. And so we'd love for you to share a little bit about how that works um, for you. Yeah, I'm a pretty classic introvert. So I I have always made space to just recharge myself. And, you know, like Sunday, we have a huge family Zoom. Like, I don't talk to all the people in my family all the time, but I probably talk to my mom and a couple of my sisters more than anybody else in my family. But yeah, I mean, part of it is I just find ways to recharge myself. I am. Um, I'm also right now working with my therapist through Resma Minicum's amazing practices about their around healing racial trauma. Um, so it's less because I have some super specific thing that I'm working on, but just a generalized. So I see the time I meet with my therapist every week as time I'm setting aside for myself. But I don't, I don't overbook. I feel, oh, I feel overbooked 
say we're not talking about quarantine or working, you know, all being trapped in our homes. Um, but just during regular times, I don't book more than maybe three nights a week doing something active with other people outside my house because I start to feel overwhelmed. And if I do more than that, then I have to like come home and literally not speak to anybody for days. So part of that, and I also work from home wherever I am in the world. So I have a lot of space with myself and I kind of dig hanging out with myself. So that's cool. Um, yeah, that's, that's the only way I know how to do it. I mean, I know people have many more pressures on them and I'm not in a place where I have to care for children. Um, and even my parents live basically a thousand miles from me when I'm in the U S and much farther away when I'm not. And I am blessed that I have, um, these beautiful sisters who take more everyday care of them. But my mom is still, she's extremely independent. She lives on her own. She still drives, even though she's driving less on the freeway because she thinks these young people are crazy. Um, I'm super, super lucky in those ways. Both my parents did really well in, over the last year plus, and they're both safe and healthy. And yeah, I know so much, so many people who've lost so much that I just mostly yeah. feel lucky to have the people I have. Yeah, I love like the the amount of gratitude you've projected in during this conversation is awesome and mm. it's been wonderful talking and hearing your story. I think we wanted to make sure like not a specific question, but is there anything that we haven't talked about that you want to make sure you get out into the world, um share with us? in part upon us um, before we let you get along with your afternoon? Um, I think I'm good. I mean, I have, I do participate in a couple of polyamorous oriented communities. One is just like a monthly support group, which is where I met the person I talked to you about before. Um, and um, the other is a broader community community. Um, and I, it's nice to have those communities. I, it's nice to have spaces where you can just <clears throat> be yourself. I mean, I do keep a separation between my professional life and my personal life, but I think only in the ways that other people do. My long-term research partners, my students know most things about me, probably more than they would want just because we travel around the world together. So we share a living space and stuff like that. But yeah, otherwise it's pretty nothing of note. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Well, like Finn said, thank you so much for agreeing to share your story and wanting to get this out there. It was wonderful to talk to you. And uh, I think your story is absolutely beautiful and you're yeah. a beautiful person. So thank, thank you. you so much thank yeah. you yeah and i also wanted to maybe just give some hope to the the male engineering and science students out there that <laughs> it is easier in some capacities for the ladies in but in the dating world in the <laughs> dating world but that's not to say i mean come on it's that's we, mostly we, when you're younger wait until you turn 50 yeah. everything changes yeah. everything changes <laughs> uh-oh <laughs> i will say too like it was hard um just for me, you, like it was easy to complain about it in that uh, when you're in the environment, but then you have to look at like all of the other inequalities that happen between men in science and, you know, STEM fields and women. And you're like, well, I think we can give up the fact that like it's a 40 to one ratio um, in our <laughs> classes. Like, I think, yeah. I think, I think that's, um, uh, Getting, hardly something to bitch about and it's getting better and better it is so that's my i don't know two cents on even that. in the years we were in school it got it it evened out slightly in that time frame so i don't know if i agree with that <laughs> <laughs> nevertheless thank you uh kelly for being here we appreciate it um and you're always welcome back on to share whatever it is you would like uh with the world so thank you thanks
And we're back. Thank you so much, Kelly, for reaching out to us, sharing your story and being vulnerable with us. It was amazing to talk to you and we're so excited to be able to share your story. So thanks again. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Kelly. And one more huge thank you. Shout out to the Patreon community for supporting the show. Uh, You all mean the world to us. We love you all. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Also, a reminder, if you want to get into one of the meet and greets for free, send us a voicemail with your thoughts on STD check that we can use in the intro to help share the love share the wealth and uh we'll hook you up yes please do that and again a reminder our website normalizingnonmonogamy.com you can find show notes there contact us button or the resources like finn just mentioned go to stdcheck.com so uh all of that on our website and next week our regularly scheduled episode will be with Jacqueline from the Curious Fox podcast. So you're not going to want to miss this one. It's amazing. It is. It is incredible. So yes, thank you in advance, Jacqueline. And once again, thank you, Kelly, for coming on. We will see everybody in a week. We hope you enjoy the rest of your week. I yes. mean, you're only halfway through. Right. Unless you're listening to this on Friday, <laughs> and then you're pretty much done. Right. Then it's the weekend. But then we're a little offended that you waited till Friday. <laughs> right. Why didn't you listen to this on Wednesday? So... Send us an email. Let us know why you waited until Friday. <laughs> okay. And we'll figure out if that's a valid excuse. Right. Right. Now, what if they waited till the next week? <sighs> <No>. <laughs> okay. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening.